is Messi! It is the cleanest of clean finishes from the best on the planet. It's time for the biggest sports stories. Liverpool, the champions of Europe, are top of the world. The biggest interviews. That uh, such a great spectacle is ruined by such such thuggish behaviour. And all the analysis right here. He's the one player that has the arrogance to think that he can play in any stadium in the world and any pitch in the world, in front of any player in the world, and take them on. Every weekday, it's my sport, it's your sport. It's CFM Sport. Let's join the team for the biggest show in the world of sport on ZFM Stereo. My station, your station. It's a very good evening, Zimbabwe. It's a Friday evening. That means it's our preview show, and this one is particularly special and exciting because there are two big events that are kicking off. One is a one-day event. The other one goes over a period of time, but the sports have always been rivals. What am I talking about? It is the impact sports of rugby and American football. Which way do you swing? Well, we'll give you a preview of the Six Nations, which kicks off this weekend, as well as the Super Bowl, which takes place in America on Sunday evening, American time, Monday morning, if you're here in Africa. The team is here, Mike Madoda, Chris Meadzi, Alois Bunjira, Sean Tafirinika, our producer, and my name is Barry Manandi. Well, as I pointed out, today, International Sports News sits front and center, and it's time for the biggest in American sport, the biggest event in American sports, as Tom Brady's Tampa Bay Buccaneers go up against Patrick Mahomes' Kansas City Chiefs in the Super Bowl 55. And then Six Nations kicks off this weekend, as I said, and Eddie Jones wants to see his new midfield combination lead to a more dominant display from England when they take on Scotland. We'll take you around the world in 60, starting off in Australia, where Rafael Nadal feels he's still far from the level required to play at the Australian Open, which is scheduled to start on Monday. In news from Bahrain, the chief executive of Formula One, Stefano Domenicali, says the season could start with two races in Bahrain due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but he's still confident of putting on a record 23 rounds of races and we'll touch down in the united states where steve stricker showed his prospective Ryder cup players how to negotiate tpc scottsdale as he made a superb start at the waste management phoenix open the party on drive time radio always starts off right here on zfm sports so don't miss out on our play of the day party friday fire friday and then it's the beautiful game in the second half of the show kicking off on the continent at chan where the atlas lions of morocco are aiming to successfully defend their title when they battle west african heavyweights mali in the final on sunday we have a full preview right here on the show in the premier league thomas tuchel has held chelsea's performance in their win at top them, but said that they will look to create more clear-cut chances. The big game in England this weekend is Manchester City's trip to Anfield to take on Liverpool, who are teetering in the title race. We'll go to Italy, where Juve will host rivals Roma at the Allianz Stadium tomorrow and a win is of utmost importance for both teams who harbour title aspirations. We'll also have updates from La Liga, the Bundesliga and Liga. But always first up is our power play here, Fire Friday. As Mike said, the party gets started right here. Here's Jason Derulo. Let me say it properly. Jason Derulo. It's featuring Adam <laughs> Levine. <laughs> this one's called Lifestyle. Hi, this is Alexandra Maseko, and I'm the national basketball team captain, and you're listening to ZFM Sport. Z. All right, so you can catch us online at ZFM Sport on all of the platforms. Why don't you follow us and then keep the conversation going even outside of the show. And YouTube is great because you can listen to back editions of the show. And then, of course, in our individual capacities, we are all over the place on social media. That is at Mike Madoda is the handle to follow at Chris Meadzi at Gazaman14. That's Alois Bunjira at Sean Tafirinika. And I'm on at Barry Manandi. We are going to be talking Super Bowl 55 later on in the show. But first, our local sports news roundup. The Home Front. Local sports news and analysis. 
Your local sports news roundup starts with rugby, where Abigail Manekwa has been appointed to the Rugby Africa Women Rugby Advisory Subcommittee for Leadership, Training and Conferences. Try slapping that on a letterhead, Barry Manandi. <laughs> uh, appointment comes barely three months after the Zimbabwe Rugby Union President Aaron Jani became an executive member of Rugby Africa's Women Advisory Committee. The Zimbabwe Rugby Union congratulated Monikwa on her appointment, uh, saying this was a reward for her tireless work in uplifting the women's game and her involvement on the medical front. Moving on to Paralympics, where the Zimbabwe Paralympics team left the country today for the Dubai 2021 World Para-Athletics Grand Prix. The Grand Prix is serving as a qualifying competition for the Olympic Games. The team, which has been in a bubble for the past week, completed their preparations yesterday. The Vice President of the Zimbabwe National Paralympic Committee and the Chef de Mission, Alexander Mukandla, is confident the athletes will do well at the Grand Prix. Let's wrap it up with volleyball news, where the chairperson of the Mateveland North Volleyball Association Sifiso Wulfungu says that they could become a top beach volleyball resort if they exploited the natural beach in their province. What is he talking about? He's talking about Binga, which has a sand beach which is located on the Zambezi River. And that, of course, is in Matabeleland, North Province. And, of course, they believe that it's sitting on millions of dollars in untapped tourism opportunities as the beach is not being utilized. Binga Rural District Council, that's BRDC, and the Zimbabwe National Parks and Wildlife Management Authority co-manage the place which lies less than two kilometers down a steep slope from the Binga Aerodrome. From the front of the grid to the back of the net, it's ZFM Sport. International Sports News Roundup, where the world comes out to play. It's a big weekend, it's a big weekend, especially in America, because it's time for the Super Bowl. Super Bowl 55 it is, and Tom Brady is the most decorated player in NFL history. But heading into Super Bowl 55 in the early hours of Monday morning, the Bucks and their 43-year-old quarterback are a small underdog against 25-year-old superstar quarterback Patrick Mahomes and the defending Super Bowl champions, Kansas City Chiefs. The kickoff is at 1.30 a.m. Let's hear from those two QBs, as they call them in the States, the quarterbacks. Let's hear from Tom Brady and then Patrick Mahomes. I have enough experience to know it's not that easy. Let me say that. It's, <laughs> there's a lot of things that go into getting to this point in the season. And um, it's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of effort. It's a lot of uh, doing the right thing on a consistent basis. So I, every team at the beginning of the year has expectations to you know, be the best they could be. And whatever that means, you know, some teams are at different phases of, uh, of competing. Uh, I think we all felt like we had a team that could compete with anybody. And, you know, at the same time, you know, there's a lot to try to figure out. And we were figuring it out all the way through the year. And I still feel like we're a team that's trying to improve. And I would say a, a team that's trying to get better. So we're gonna use all the time we have right up to game time to try to be the best we can be. And we're playing against a great football team. And uh, we're gonna have to be at our best. Z. I think it was the mindset of the guys in the locker room. I mean, uh, we, we really had that belief that we had to put in the exact same amount of work, if not more than we did the year before. Um, and so, uh, the mindset of those leaders in the locker room, uh, it, it kind of put through the whole entire team and guys came to work every single day with the mindset of making it back. The guys really embraced being in these big stage games. Uh, if you look at us throughout the year on the, the primetime games or the Monday night games or whatever it is, uh, guys played better. And uh, I'm not going to say we, we relaxed in the, in the season because you have to play uh, with all your effort if you're going to win games week in and week out. But I remember that. That first eye week that we had uh, for playoffs, uh, that the intensity of practice just from the offense going against the defense, you knew that things were different and you knew that guys were ready to go. Z. Mike, uh, American football is all about the quarterbacks because they are the star men, they are the star turns. And in truth, I, I think in terms of mouth-watering encounters, uh, this one certainly has served up an absolute treat. You've got the the old timer who's going for his seventh, and so there's incentive there. And then there is obviously the heir apparent, who's actually the defending champion. The subplot is fantastic. 
Yeah, absolutely, Barry. It's a clash of generations and it's also a clash of arguably the two best quarterbacks uh, in the NFL at the moment. Uh, one, a wily veteran and the other one, of course, uh, the bright new spark uh, in the league. And so it's going to be very, very interesting. And if you take a look at their season stats, Barry, very little separating those guys. If you take a look at their passing yards, if you take a look at the touchdowns and even the completion percentage, you'd give Mahomes a slight edge. Uh, but that's merely a function of him playing for a better team. And I believe that he leads the better offensive outfit and he's the better quarterback. Uh, all respect, of course, goes out to Tom Brady. But in this game, you rightly pointed out uh, that he is going to be the underdog. And I think, uh, listen, the incentive for Mahomes coming up against uh, Tom Brady is one where he's really trying to assert his dominance as the best quarterback in the league. And for Tom Brady, there's, of course, uh, that... Um, uh, chase uh, for immortality where he's going for his seventh uh, Super Bowl win. This is his 10th final, but for Mahomes, Mahomes will be trying to do it back to back. The last team to win it back to back uh, was, of course, uh, a Tom Brady led <laughs> New England Patriots. That was in 2004. So there is history to be made, whether it's Tom Brady or Patrick Mahomes. Absolutely. And Mike fittingly ends on that uh, factor that you look at the, the last QB, the last team to do it back to back. It was, and it, it's a, almost a strange irony, isn't it, Chris? It's, it's, it's sort of contrived to give us this, this tasty encounter where the last one to do it was Tom Brady. And now here's Patrick Mahomes standing on the cusp. And who's the man standing in front of him? It's Tom Brady, who's chasing his seven. It makes a fantastic storyline, um, especially what Mike mentioned about a clash of generations. Because if you take a look at it, Tom Brady won his first uh, Super Bowl in 2002. Mahomes was literally in kindergarten, which is our version of preschool at the time. So the two quarterbacks meet. I think this is their fifth meeting um, in their career, second time in postseason. And in terms of their head-to-head matchups, um, this is probably going to be the tastiest one. The tastiest one and the tiebreaker because Mike, they're sitting at two and two. Uh, so again, it's evenly poised. But for you, obviously this is a team sport. We keep talking about the QBs. For you, who's got the better team? Who's got the setup uh, that achieves the result at the end of the day? Well, if you take a look uh, at uh, the games in which uh, Brady uh, beat Mahomes, uh, he was with the New England Patriots. Uh, it hasn't gone well for him uh, when he's with, with, the, with the Bucks uh, because uh, they lost to the Chiefs 27-24. Uh, it was a close game. Uh, but uh, I don't think uh, the Chiefs in that game played anywhere near the level that they're capable of. So I am going with the Chiefs for this one. Uh, I think that uh, Mahomes has got a bit more uh, in his uh, armory uh, than Brady. Uh, and I think he's got a lot more options to pick from in, in terms of who to pick out on the field. If you take a look, of course, at um, uh, the likes of Travis uh, Kelsey, uh, star wide receiver Tyreek Hill. Uh, these are some of the stars uh, of the league, Barry. And I expect the Chiefs to have an edge. I don't think they're going to blow the Bucks away, uh, mm. but I think they're going to have uh, perhaps a comfortable victory. A comfortable victory for the Chiefs, according to Mike Madonna. You can put that in your uh, betting permutations if you like. So he reckons that uh, Patrick Mahomes has got a little bit more in his armory. Chris, would you agree with that? Would you say, because some people say that Tom Brady now has got uh, the basics down. If you want someone who can deliver in the clutch, somebody who can make the, the, the game look simple, you're talking about Tom Brady, but someone who's going to excite, somebody who's going to light up the stage, you're looking at Patrick Mahomes. Which way does this go? Um, it's, it's incredibly tricky. Um, both of these quarterbacks, absolutely brilliant, like you mentioned. Um, I think it's going to obviously have the entertainment factor, but I think when it comes down to it, I think uh, the youth, the exuberance of youth is going to prevail here. <laughs> so I'm thinking Patrick Mahomes over the wily old veteran Tom Brady. But of course, the Super Bowl is far more than just the game. And we love talking about the game because we are a sports show. But remember, we're also an entertainment show. It's prime time entertainment, sportstainment, if you if you like. And indeed, the Super Bowl embodies sportstainment, doesn't it? And the halftime show is a big part of that, Mike. Yeah, absolutely, Barry. It's a, it's a commercial uh, evening out in the United States of America. It's more than just sporting. Uh, this is when the big marketing and advertising dollars come to the fore. Uh, if you take a look, Barry, at uh, some of the uh, prices that they're putting on uh, advertisements during the Super Bowl, Super Bowl uh, they'll be running anywhere between sort of like... Um, 
uh, your uh, five million to six million dollar range. That's for a thirty second spot. Uh, think about that. Yeah, uh, thirty yeah. second spot, and <laughs> you've got companies in Zimbabwe, Barry, that are running uh, running advertising campaigns for a hundred thousand US dollars. Sometimes even half that amount. I'm talking about a thirty second TV commercial during the Super yeah, Bowl yeah. on prime time television will cost you five and a half million dollars. I mean, it's a yeah. different planet, isn't it, Barry? It's a completely different uh, planet. Uh, <laughs> and if you look at it, the the that. 30 second spot uh, actually outweighs many of the marketing budgets of local companies which is a <laughs> damning indictment isn't it Chris uh, but beyond that of course there is that halftime show where this time it's a turn of the weekend it's the weekend um, he's a Canadian artist obviously we know the weekend um, it's got some incredible hits um, some with Ariana Grande uh, earned it I can feel it I can't feel my face and I can feel it coming <laughs> Um, the thing about this is uh, the Super Bowl halftime performance, people have always wondered how they make these selections. And I think this year what they wanted to get was someone with crossover appeal um, to multiple segments of the market. And that's what they've managed to do with The weekend. Yeah, and let me tell you, Super Bowl, albeit that it kicks off at 1.30 a.m., it's well worth the watch. And uh, the great thing about watching American football is that they can talk you through and you sort of get an understanding because many of us don't get the rules. We know that, but they talk you through it and you can get an understanding. And then, of course, there is that great halftime. Can, can, can I just explain it, Barry, for Zimbabweans? Sure. But uh, Zimbabweans, obviously, we played rugby a lot. Yeah. It's, it's just a fancy gaining ground. That's what it yes. is. <laughs> exactly. Ground. That's what it is. <laughs> so if you played gaining ground uh, at at high school or whatever the case in rugby, nah, uh, I'd be surprised like... if you play gaining grounds in high school, Barry. It was a <laughs> primary school sport. <laughs> <laughs> no, do you know what we used to? We used to just love doing that when it wasn't practice. We were just uh, love doing that. It, it, just it hoofing the ball on jubilee. Hoofing the ball and just enjoying gaining ground. So it's a bit like that uh, with uh, some twists and a bit more uh, padding, as it were, American football. Super Bowl 55 out in the States should be absolutely entertaining. Hi, I'm JC Krill, Springbok and Blue Bulls backline player. You are listening to ZFM Sports. It's all about impact sport, like Barry said at the top of the show. And this time, we're going to the European variety, which is rugby. And the Six Nations kicks off this weekend with Eddie Jones wanting to see his new midfield combination leading to a more dominant display from England when they kick off their 2021 Six Nations Championship against Scotland in the Calcutta Cup. Head coach Jones has handed Ollie Lawrence a start at inside centre alongside Henry Slade for that clash at Twickenham with captain Owen Farrell moving to fly half and number 10 George Ford dropping to the replacements bench so Scotland are no pushovers Barry they'll always give you a game but uh, it's the sort of game that you can at least try and make a few changes and try and experiment as a coach yeah you can you can you can experiment uh, also because of I think the comments made by Gregor Townsend the, the um, uh, Scotland coach who says that uh, Scotland has enough depth for them to play around and, and, and use a combination of new players, the experienced players, and some who've shown that they can cut it at test level. So if Scotland is doing that, then what more England, who've got a very good record coming into this competition, who themselves uh, have a few challenges, in, especially up front uh, uh, in the forwards area. Uh, so it's a good time to just uh, spar, as it were, against Scotland. A good opportunity for Eddie Jones and his charges. Well, England go into this year's Six Nations Championship as the defending champions and with an impressive run of results under their belt. But the one criticism around England, Chris, has been around their approach. People are saying that they don't have the flair, they don't have the adventure. And that's one area where the critics are going to be watching to say, OK, do you have it in you to actually step up the gas and compete with the Southern Hemisphere nations? Because if England is using the Six Nations to build up to a World Cup performance, then it's about beating the All Blacks. It's about beating the Springboks and beating the Wallabies. And to beat those teams, you've got to have a bit in attack. 
So in as much as the critics are going to be watching out for a bit more flair and adventure um, from the England side, I think what's critical for Eddie Jones at the moment is to simply grind out the wins because he's lost a couple of key players, um, including Marco Vinipola, Sam Underhill. And so in the Six Nations tournament, as much as it's a build-up, what he wants to do is to get these wins. And I think at some point then he's able to incorporate more flair and adventure. But what is critical at this point is to get the wins. And in order to get the wins, they will have to play how England has been playing, despite what the critics may say. So England are definitely favourites to win the Six Nations Championship, but they're going to be pushed, Barry. They're going to be pushed all the way by France, who experienced something of a, a renaissance uh, last year. I mean, uh, they were uh, a team on the rise and are a team that are expecting to do big things over the next 24 months. 100%. And uh, listen, they want to carry on that momentum uh, that has shown that they are a team that is uh, uh, resurgent, a team that, as you quite rightly point out, is in a bit of a re renaissance. Uh, so they want, won't want to drop off at all. Uh, so my view is I think you're 100% right that uh, France is going to push England all the way. And the Eddie Jones and his team will, will, be, will be very wary of that and they'll be wise to watch out for Le Bleu. Of course, the other sides include Wales, who have an aging squad, and so they need fresh legs in that squad if they are to do well. And I don't think it's going to be in this particular tournament. The Irish as well have been inconsistent uh, over the last 24 months, so I'm not expecting them to challenge. And we have a producer's note for Italy. <laughs> Useless, rubbish team. Ha, 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 ha. I hope the Italian ambassador is not listening. <laughs> Well, let's give you a week of quick uh, from the first round of the Six Nations. Everything gets underway tomorrow with two matches. The first one kicking off uh, in the afternoon, and it's Italy who are rubbish taking on France, <laughs> who are fast improving. And then it's the Calcutta Cup as the two rivals go head to head. It's England versus Scotland at Twickenham. And then Wales will welcome the Irish to the Millennium Stadium in Cardiff. Before we go, guys, who do you think is going to win the championship? Is everyone uh, calling England as the winners here? I'm not. I'm calling France. Same with you, Barry. I'm with France. Chris, I saw you. Uh, uh, I'm with England. Your head. I'm going for England. She's going for England. She's playing it safe. Uh, so we'll get to see <laughs> who bags it all after a few weeks of action. Coming up, we take you around the world in 60 with the rest of your international sports news. Hi, I'm Trevor Nyakani, the Blue Balls and Springbok prop, and now you're listening to ZFM Sports. Around the world in 60 seconds, international sports news. We take off in Australia where Rafael Nadal feels he's still far from the level required to play at the Australian Open, which is scheduled to start on Monday. Nadal pulled out of Spain's ATP Cup tie against Australia on Tuesday with a lower back problem and despite improvement, he remains below his best level. We'll head over to Bahrain where Chief Executive of Formula One Stefano Domenicali says the season could start with two races in Bahrain due to COVID-19 pandemic but he's still confident of putting on a record 23 rounds of races. The current schedule has the Gulf Kingdom opening on the 28th of March, followed by Imola in Italy on the 18th of April. Australia, the regular start to the season was last month postponed to November. Domenicali, who took over at the helm in January, told a virtual media roundtable that Formula One had plenty of backup options. We'll touch down in the United States where Steve Stricker showed his prospective Ryder Cup play how to negotiate TPC Scottsdale as he made a superb start at the Waste Management Phoenix Open. The US Ryder Cup captain fired a 6 under 65 to sit just six, just two shots behind first round leaders Matthew Naismith and Mark Hubbard, putting headline acts John Rahm, Justin Thomas and Rory McIlroy firmly in the shade amid a muted atmosphere at the usually frenzied Arizona venue. Hi, I'm Varios Coach Zdravko Logarusic and you are listening to ZFM Sport. Sports with a difference. Z. The big leagues. The big teams. The big players. The beautiful game on ZFM Sport. The lion roars. The warrior beats his drum. Battle lines are drawn in the jungles of Cameroon. 
It's your Chan 2021 report on VFM Sport. Everything heading towards a thrilling climax in the final of the Chan Championships on Sunday evening. It's the West African heavyweights, Mali, taking on the defending champions, the Atlas Lions of Morocco. We expected Morocco to be good, just not this good. They stormed into the final, putting host Cameroon to the sword 4-0. And then Mali needed a penalty shootout, beating Guinea 5-4 after their clash ended goalless in regular time as well as the added 30 minutes of extra time so it should be an absolute barnstormer this one Alois Munjira just the sort of final that the organizers would have been hoping for of course of course of course Mike you know whenever whenever there is a final we want the best teams to actually appear in the final and this time around you know it looks like it, it was actually fixed but no it is not fixed but it's actually genuine because these are the teams that are playing good football and not just good football as an as national teams we can actually see even their clubs are doing well in africa as well so it was to be expected especially morocco they've done well with their development they've been doing well with their clubs in africa so we, we, we were looking forward to actually having morocco in, in, in the final as well Cameroon, unfortunately, they had to come. Uh, they had to come against, uh, come up against uh, against Morocco because probably Morocco for me, I think they are the the strongest team in Africa. When you actually look at their club club sides as well in Africa, so it's going to be a very good, interesting final as well. Morocco certainly looking good and they have been full of goals apart from that 4-0 drubbing of the indomitable Lions. They've also thumped Zambia 3-1 and they also beat Uganda 5-2. Very impressive wins, full of goals. And of course, their coach is Hochine Amuta and they, he's a local lad, Barry. You take a look at Mali, another one uh, managed by a local lad as well. Uh, I'll give you another stat. I think of the eight nations that were in the quarterfinals, seven of them had local coaches. Did we miss a trick as Zimbabwe? Um, yes we, yes and no, uh, on the basis that yes, you can have a foreign coach, but you need to then lean on the local coaches. I think we had the right blend. We had a foreign coach, but our two local coaches uh, who were his assistants actually coach in the Premier League. Now, that was a, almost the making of a perfect storm in that had he lent on his assistants and their experience, their knowledge, their nows, as to the local players, I think would have got a, a better output. But I think there was a bit of mistrust there. So perhaps in that regard, we certainly missed a trick. Uh, Chris, let's talk about Mali. Uh, yesterday we were talking about Italia 90 and how Argentina got to the final uh, of Italia 90. They did it by winning penalty shootouts in the quarters and semi-finals. It's the same formula that has been used by Mali, isn't it, at this tournament? They beat Congo 5-4 on penalties uh, in the quarters, and then they beat Guinea 5-4 uh, on penalties in the semi-finals. So if one takes a look at their performances, they look like they've got a very tenacious defense, but they've been struggling to score goals in the matches that matter. Yeah, they've been struggling to score goals. Um, if you take a look at their wins, their, their 1 0 wins, 1 0 draws. Um, that was with uh, Burkina Faso, um, draw with Cameroon, 1 0 win over Zimbabwe. So they, 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 I think it's a team that's recognized their strengths, and that is that they, they're not necessarily brilliant um, with the scoring. So what they've done is have a solid defense and like you said make sure they get uh to the penalty shootout and then win um on the basis of that so look it's a solid strategy and it's worked and it's gotten them to the final alloy so you're gonna call a winner for us yeah i am calling a winner i'm calling a winner mike like i said i think if you if you listen when i was talking i was talking i was leaning towards the towards Morocco. So for me, I think Morocco is a well old machine. They play good football. Their development has been remarkable and they actually are a very good example of how to develop football in Africa. So I'm going with Morocco. Well, one of the things that they have done, and I think uh, which impressed Alois very much, Barry, was uh, the building of a national uh, training center out in Morocco. This is a facility that uh, cost them 65 million US dollars that houses all their national teams and even visiting national teams as well. When you're going to play against Morocco, they actually accommodate you of this facility. This is a facility that can match the best facilities in the world, and it's rated as the best in Africa. Yeah, and uh, if you look at uh, that facility, that 65 million is going to pay for itself over a very short space of time because of the strides that are going to be made by Moroccan football. Already we're seeing them in the Chan final. Likelihood we're going to see them there or thereabouts, possibly in the final four 
at the very minimum of AFCON and that's because they are building the structures because that national uh, training center also houses their national age group sides. They are watching their heroes, the first team trains there and it's almost a Clairefontaine model uh, that was started out in France and everybody looked at that and said that's the model of football to, to, to adapt and Morocco has done so fantastically well. However, I'm not tipping them for this final. You're tipping Mali? I'm tipping Mali, and that's heart more than head. Uh, what, what have you seen? What have you seen? Okay, well, well, tell us maybe, just to make it all make sense. What have you seen yeah. from Mali that makes you believe that, you know what, they may stop this rampant Moroccan side from scoring? Organization. I've seen a Mali side that's very organized. Uh, their, their coach Diani uh, organizes them very well. They, they don't necessarily sort of drop off and let you have the ball and defend all the time. No. They play, uh, but in their play, it's very structured and they've got some good wingers who very, very at pace. We say, we say the same <laughs> about Zambia. They have three past them. We say the same about Cameroon, that they had athletes, they were big, they were strong, they had a nice defensive setup. They had four put past them. If Mali do go on and win, it'll be something of a surprise. Now, that's the only, the, not the, the only game. Out, maybe. Yeah, maybe a penalty shootout like Chris said. <laughs> but that's not the only game of African interest, guys. The Club World Cup is underway. And of course, African champions Al Akli, they beat Al Duahil 1 0 in an edgy affair to set up a semi final clash against German giants Bayern Munich at that tournament, which is being held in Qatar. Who's the manager or the coach of Al Akli? It is Pizzo Mosimane. He's always wanted to pit himself against the best Chris. And there's none bigger and none better than Bayern Munich. None bigger, none better than Bayern Munich. And I think for him as a coach, uh, this is this is as high as it gets. And he likely would want to win this match and possibly then crown himself the best coach on the continent. Well, is it about winning Alois or is it about the experience here? Because surely there must be an element in Pizzo's mind and in the player's mind that, you know what, these guys are just too good for us. We're up against Lewandowski. We are up against Thomas Muller. We are up against Joseph Alaba. We are up against Manuel Neuer. These are the names that will go down in the European football or World Football Hall of Fame. Do you think for the Al Akhli players that they've got genuine hopes of upsetting this team or they're just going to go out, enjoy the occasion and enjoy the experience? I think they're just going there into, uh, into this match to enjoy the experience, Mike. I think just by being at the tournament, I think they are they, they've actually done well. You know, it's actually exciting that they are there. And then to actually go and beat a team in the quarterfinals and be in the final is actually a cap on their, on, on their head. And then the icing on the cake is actually not to win against Bayern Munich, but to actually play against Bayern Munich. To, for Pizzo to actually stand there on the touchline giving instructions and Hans Flick is standing just two, three meters away giving, I think for Pizzo, it's actually satisfaction enough to be there because they already know that they are playing against probably one of the best clubs in the world and they've got no chance. If they do manage to win, yes, it's going to be like a fluke and flukes happen and miracles do happen, but very unlikely. But to be just there, to play against Bayern Munich, I think is actually good enough for, the, for Pizzo and his team. And the benefits, Barry, will go beyond uh, what happens on the field of play because in terms of uh, commercial dollars, you can tell why teams are like, like al uh, are where they are, why this team has got an annual budget of 160 million US dollars, which competes quite favorably with some of the teams that are playing in top flight Europe. So you take a look at the benefits that will come with them playing against Bayern Munich. That's the sort of exposure that any corporate on the continent and even other corporates that are located in mainland Europe and the Americas, they would want to associate with a team that gives their brand and their services that level of exposure. 100%, not to mention the money that they earn just for going to the tournament and progressing uh, all the way to the semi-finals in inverted commas. Yes, there are only a few teams that go to the Club World Cup, but being in the semi-final itself, likelihood just being in the semi-final far outweighs the prize money that they gain for winning the Champions League proper. So it's it's a big payday for Al Ahli and you need to expose your team to this level of competition in order for you to make the dollars back that keeps you in that sort of uh, um, rat race as it were uh, to keep making those dollars and, and, and keep your, your team up there. Now Al Ahli is doing it at the, at the highest level.
Well, if people say Pizzo Mosimane had a soft landing at Al Ahly, well, maybe. But if you then consider the fact that African clubs at the World Club, uh, World at the World uh, Club at the Club World Cup, are uh, invariably knocked out in the first game of the tournament, this is actually progress for African football managing to get to the last four of the tournament. It just shows you that he's had an impact and that he's having some effect at Al Ahly as a club. And we wish him the best when he takes on Bayern Munich in Qatar. All the rivalry. Here is Harry Kane for Tottenham. All the stars. Oh, back here is Liverpool two in front. Talk about impudence. Talk about improvisation. Talk about Sadio Mane. And all the game-changing moments. And Raheem Sterling rattles at home. And once more, City are in front in a choice. All the updates from the Premier League on ZFM Sport. Let's go over to England. There was the last match of the last match day last night <laughs> and it involved Chelsea and Tottenham in the London derby and Thomas Tuchel hailed Chelsea's performance in their win at Tottenham but said they will look to create more clear-cut chances. Jorginho's first half penalty was enough to secure victory in London in the London derby. Uh, the visitors largely dominated. Let's hear from Thomas Tuchel. Every experience we we make is a step forward if we are open to learn from it. And uh, um, if there are moments where we could, there were moments, especially in the first half, for long, long, maybe the whole first half, we could totally control the game, very up high the pitch. Mm. Then in the second half, we had some easy ball losses, lost a bit, little bit of, of um, maybe the, the confidence uh, because of the ball losses. Then there were moments where we could escape the pressure and had fast attacks, but we could not finish. So by minute by minute, we lost a little bit like, like ball possession, but we never lost the belief, we never lost the structure and the intensity to defend. And you know, in football, there are many ways to, to, to have a good performance. And if it's necessary to suffer, you have to be ready to suffer, and that's what I'm very happy about. Z. And Alois, you've got to say that uh, in truth, yes, the scoreline flatters Tottenham uh, because they were battered, certainly in that first half. And then when Tottenham decided to start playing, uh, the match looked a lot more balanced. But still, uh, I think that uh, Chelsea shaded it. Yeah, you know, Perry, to be honest, you know, a manager plays a big part in any team. You know, when when Spurs were playing with Pochettino, yes, they were not the league champions and all that, but they were an exciting team. They were scoring goals. And even when uh, Mourinho took over, they were still in that momentum of, of actually playing hard, attacking football, scoring goals. But you can actually see the decline now. They've already started to change. Mourinho has changed them into that team that sits back and waits and try to hit on the counter. And it's already a boring game. No, I'm a, I'm a fan of Jose Mourinho, but I, I, I don't like the way he has changed um, uh, Tottenham Hotspur. They actually look so ordinary. They were dominated by Chelsea, especially in that first half. Chelsea, the unfortunate part is they don't create as much chances. Even the commentator said so. We were talking about they don't create as much chances as as they as they as they should because they dominated possession, crisp passing, hundred percent. They were structured very well, but they just couldn't get those goals and chances. But Spurs, the way they play, I'm not impressed at all. And I can understand, Barry, why uh, Chelsea at the moment look like they're not uh, creating a, a lot of chances. Uh, and I think uh, sometimes, uh, just listening to some of the pundits on television, I thought uh, it was a, an unjust criticism of Thomas Tuchel. Here's a guy who's been in charge for only three matches. And if you're yeah. to build a championship challenging side, you need to start with your defence. And that's what yeah. he's done. He's shored up that defence, which was so leaky uh, under Frank Lampard, one of the worst defences in the league. What have we seen uh, from Chelsea? under Thomas Tuchel three matches played zero goal conceded three clean yeah. sheets he's won two matches he's drawn one so he's getting the fundamentals right before we start talking about how they can carve open opposition defenses I think Thomas Tuchel right now he's building the right way at Chelsea and Tottenham will be lucky that they lost 1-0. They were yeah. outplayed in that game. Uh, Alois talked about the fact that he's disappointed in Mourinho. And for me, this is when I always say that Mourinho has got a small club mentality. That's what he has. 
small club mentality because Spurs are capable of going toe to toe with the biggest of teams because they have the talent, they have the ability. I'm just trying to think of the injury suffered by Liverpool. The amount of players that have gone missing are still missing. If that was Mourinho in charge, I just wonder what approach Liverpool would take and where they would be right now. It would be a total disaster. He's missing just two or three players and yeah, yet he's yeah. gone defensive. He's playing like Burnley. <laughs> he is. He's playing a, a lot like Burnley, Chris. And you, you sort of, uh, it's easy for you to drop off, put numbers in the box and try not to get beaten. Uh, and that's what Mourinho is doing. But I think it takes a lot more for you going forward. Um, Chelsea themselves, you can see what Thomas Tuchel wants to do. You can see the structure of the team. You can see that they're attacking a tent intent. The only tragedy I think of last night is that he may have lost uh, Thiago Silva, who was the man he was trying to build that defense that Mike is talking uh, about around. Uh, and uh, it may be for a few weeks. It may be for a few weeks um, and it, it's, it's unfortunate, but I think we're seeing the mark of a good coach and a good team when these injuries are happening, probably because of the frequency um, of the, uh, the the games that the players are engaged in at the moment. Because of that, we're seeing a lot more injuries, but it takes a really good manager um, to almost shore up the team such that the damage when a particular player is not there is, yeah. is not as impactful. And the complete opposite is happening um, in terms of Tottenham where they've almost become a one-trick pony. Harry Kane is not there at the moment and they're almost falling apart and they're not sure of themselves, <laughs> especially in that first half. So I think we're seeing almost battle of the managers as a result of these injuries. Well, Tottenham themselves host West Bromwich Albion at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium uh, this uh, uh, weekend and we'll see how they lay out. Well, Chelsea, Chelsea travels uh, to Sheffield United, the basement side, and hopefully we'll be looking to score a few more goals and create those clear-cut chances that the team has been talking about. The rest of your weekend fixtures look like this. Aston Villa will entertain Arsenal while Burnley take on Brighton. Newcastle United take on Southampton while Fulham take on West Ham in a London derby. The Wolves will take on Leicester City and then their two big games. Manchester United take on Everton, which is very resurgent. And Liverpool will take on Manchester City easily. The box office fixture of the weekend, that one takes place on Sunday. And the Daily Mirror claimed that Liverpool boss Jurgen Klopp will be starting Fabinho alongside Jordan Ederson at centre-back against Manchester City. Fabinho has missed out on playing in Liverpool's last three games and his absence was sorely felt on Wednesday night. Alois, is this Jurgen Klopp? If it comes out like this and it's Fabinho and Henderson at the centre of that Liverpool uh, defence, is this Jurgen Klopp basically saying that he wants to batten down the hatches, circle the wagons and make sure that Liverpool doesn't lose any more points, especially against Manchester City, given that he's bought two new centre-halves and isn't willing to blood them in against Man City? Yeah, I think uh, at the moment, uh, at the moment, Perry, I think it's uh, it's more to do with uh, uh, closing shop and try not to lose matches. I think that's what he's try he's trying to do at the moment because he can't be going toe to toe with Man City at this moment in time. I think to avoid defeat is actually the best way to do it so that they can fix the problems later on as we go after they got Man City out of the way. It's actually better to actually stop Man City from collecting maximum points and go for a draw. It's even better so that they can actually fix their points knowing that Man City didn't collect maximum points from them. Uh, I don't think we'll see Jurgen Klopp play that way. Sorry, Alois. We've never seen Jurgen Klopp play that way. We've never seen Jurgen Klopp uh, at any point in his career go defensive, uh, put men behind the ball. The very fact that you're talking about Jordan Henderson and Fabinho playing at the heart of defence uh, shows you that uh, he's uh, willing to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with City. And I suspect Liverpool will go. Liverpool's problems have not been the fact that they've been outplayed by any team that's beaten Liverpool. Uh, I think the last time you can say that a team outplayed Liverpool was Aston Villa when they put seven past Liverpool. That's when you can say, yes, they were outplayed. Their problems have come in the final third, creating clear-cut scoring opportunities. So Liverpool is dominating games, but failing to score goals. And that is the, the, the lock that Jurgen Klopp has got to pick that's the, the equation that he's got to solve uh, versus Manchester City, who are a side that are playing their best football and defending very, very well. But in terms of approach, I don't expect Liverpool to sit back. They're certainly not going to do that.
Uh, but I, I, also, I also don't think that this is a match that they will dominate play like they do with other clubs. This is a game that is, they are going to be dominated as far as position is concerned. So for me, I thought <laughs> they, they could back off and close, that, the, and close the, the, the gap fact, because they will be dominated. The fact yeah, no, hey, think, listen, classically, every side is almost always dominated. Uh, but uh, if you go back to the first game uh, that Liverpool played Man City. There was very little to choose between the sides and you could say that Liverpool actually had the better game than Man City back then. In this game, even if City uh, has got more possession, but I think it's all about control. Who's going to control the game? And that's the most important thing. You can control the game with 40% possession. It's okay. Um, Mike, so if uh, whoever controls the game, is that going to be the winner? And I need you to give me a prediction as you answer that. I think City are favourites for this game. Uh, the confidence uh, that they are playing with, uh, the style, the pizzazz, uh, the ability to create chances, uh, the way that they, 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 they've they been failing to uh, last season, they've now found that edge. Uh, and so I, I suspect that City uh, will win this game uh, because they, they, they've got the ability to score and to score from midfield. However, the one thing that will work in Liverpool's favour. If you ask Jordan Henderson and Fabinho is, who would you rather be mark marking? Kun Aguero and Kevin De Bruyne or Gundogan and Gabriel Jesus? They'll tell you that, okay, we'll have Gabriel Jesus and Gundogan any, any day of the week because they know they're not going to be dominated physically and they know that those guys are not going to do anything out of this world. So that is working in Liverpool's favour. But I still suspect that uh, Man City will win this game. Uh, Alois, quick prediction. Yeah, I, I'm going with Mike there. I think uh, Man City will dominate position and they will win the game as well. Uh, Chris? Uh, Man City to win as well. I'm going to go with the 2-1 scoreline. 2-1 scoreline. Well, I think all of us uh, are agreed that Manchester City are likely to win this game. I think they're in a good moment. Uh, unfortunately, their opponents, Liverpool, are in a very bad moment. We'll end off with a quick wrap of the European League starting off in Syria where Juventus will host rivals Roma at the Allianz Stadium tomorrow and a win is of utmost importance for both teams who harbour title aspirations. Alois, you take a look at Juventus, they didn't have a fantastic start but now they seem to be on a decent run of form. Roma will be a good test of that form. Yeah, I think uh, Roma will be a good test and uh, I think Juventus as well, they haven't been really, really slick like they used to do, which is something that impresses me. I'm happy about it, you know, because I don't like a team that is carrying on winning trophies all the time. But it's going to be a very good match. It's going to be a very good match. But when you look at the history, Juventus has always had the pair of Roma. So it's going to be interesting how it's going to pan out. But like you say, I think it's going to be a very big uh, stand test. Uh, for Juventus and to check if they are really back in form or not. So we are in for a very exciting match uh, when Juve takes on Roma. Your key Serie A fixtures this weekend, Fiorentina takes on Inter Milan, Atalanta versus Torino and AC Milan versus Crotone. La Liga, your key fixtures there, Huesca will be up against Real Madrid, Athletic Club versus Valencia, Real Betis will be up against Barcelona. Bundesliga action this weekend, Hertha Berlin versus Bayern Munich, Schalke Ophir versus RB Leipzig, Freiburg versus Borussia Dortmund. And of course, if you want to catch our stars and Bayern players out playing in Ligue 1, your fixtures are as follows, Lorient versus Reims, uh, Lyon will be up against Strasbourg and El Classique, the biggest game in French football that's going to be Marseille taking on Paris Saint-Germain. That's all we have time for and we'll catch you on Monday for our review show. For now, may God richly bless you. That's my story. And I'm sticking to it. Manandi, out. And it's Messi! It is the cleanest of clean finishes from the best on the planet. The biggest sports stories. Liverpool, the champions of Europe, on top of the world. The biggest interviews. That uh, such a great spectacle is ruined by such such thuggish behaviour. And all the analysis right here. He's the one player that has the arrogance to think that he can play in any stadium in the world and any pitch in the world in front of any player in the world and take them on. Every weekday, it's my sport, it's your sport. It's CFM Sport on CFM Stereo. My station, your station.